Everybody, it's Dr. Joe's in the house. It's 7 o'clock Eastern time here in the Washington, D.C. area. Snowing. And, well, it was snowing anyway a couple of days ago, yesterday. But uh, it's cold. I hope the weather is uh, much better wherever you are. And, uh, and so today we're going to talk about um, flipping. You know, the pros and cons, lessons learned. I've done some flips in my, my time and um, had some good experiences and also had some not so great experiences in flipping. And um, I was watching um, uh, a program and uh, I heard an ad from somebody who was talking about flips and uh, he's made it sound so easy. All you gotta do is get in, get out and get paid. That was it uh, in three easy steps. And um, it got me thinking, you know, I mean, I've done flips before and I know it's not as easy as just get in, get out, get paid. There's a lot more to it than that. And so I thought, let me just have a, a session. Uh, we can talk about some of the pitfalls and some of the lessons learned uh, that I've had. And I'm sure that you've had or other people have had, uh, you know, as they've uh, attempted to do flips. And uh, again, flipping is a great strategy, uh, especially if you do it right. You have good contractors, you find the right deal. And the numbers make sense and, uh, and everything goes OK. Uh, it can be a great strategy to get chunks of cash. You get some quick money. Uh, but on the flip side, it's not as easy as, as that. Uh, the stars, to a certain extent, have to align. Mm -hmm. And uh, many times, the stars do not align. And so uh, many people get in with the expectation to make a lot of money when, in fact, they don't. Uh, I've had some projects where. I didn't make any money uh, or all the effort that was required just at the end of the day really wasn't worth it. And that's the reason why I like to do buy and hold, because the numbers may not make sense in the short term. But if you just hold on to the asset for a long time, uh, 5, 10, 15 years, essentially, uh, you know, you let time do the heavy lifting. And usually time is a lot more forgiving uh, on long term strategies as opposed to short term strategies. So that's the. That's the reason why we're having this session today. Property flipping, pitfalls, lessons learned from failed flips. Okay, so let's let's get let's get to it. And again, let me know who you are, where you're tuning in from, and uh, put out any comments. Put them in the comment box. I will be doing the Ask Doctor Joe in about twenty minutes. So if you've got some questions that you have for me, if you want to pick my brain, and uh, feel free to put comments in the uh, chat box. And I will definitely try to answer them to the best of my abilities. Okay, so the allure of property flipping, uh, especially depicted in um, the TV programs, uh, it's a quick, it's a quick, quick way, quick path to wealth. That's how they position it. Uh, but as as I said before, it's not easily as easy as that. And uh, so for those people, it's the primer. Just make sure we're on the same page. When I talk about flipping. Uh, I'm referring to a strategy whereby you purchase a property, you typically make improvements, either do a renovations or whatever it is, and then you quickly sell it uh, with the goal of making a quick profit. Okay, so that's when I talk about flipping, that's essentially what I do. I'm, that's what I'm referring to. You buy a house, uh, make some improvements, i.e., you force appreciation, and then you turn around and sell it for a profit. Okay, so while the concept sounds straightforward, which it does conceptually, you know, but numerous uh, you know investors have encountered difficulties and problems in actually implementing this, and uh, and the difficulty turns out to be obviously financial. They don't make as much money as they thought they were going to make. Uh, they lose money, uh, and so they get disappointed. Okay, so it has a financial impl implications if you don't do it right. So the reality is that it does to do this successfully. It does require you to have a deep understanding. I say deep understanding of the real estate market, where it is, where it's going, renovation costs, uh, property valuation. You've got to know the numbers. And also you've got to have an idea what buyers are looking for because you're trying to exit with a sale. So you better know what buyers are looking for in the location that you have purchased this home. Okay, So it does require some understanding of those things. Real estate market, renovation costs. Uh, property valuations, and then also buyer preferences. Uh, so what we're going to do in this live stream is to kind of uh, make a critical uh, you know, assessment of how to do this properly and also some of the lessons learned 
So hopefully you'll um, you'll benefit from these mistakes, and therefore you'll if you're going to enter flipping uh, strategy, you're going to be more successful, um, you know, and, and and so on. So that's really what we're going to do today, and I'm going to intermix with uh, real world uh, experiences, real world real world case studies, uh, both from my experiences and also other people who I've known. And uh, and hopefully, as I said before, the idea is that you learn from my mistakes, our mistakes, such that you don't have to repeat them. OK, so let's get to it. The first lesson, I think, uh, is uh, financial, you know, overextension. Um, so a common pitfall is that, uh, you know, you underestimate the cost of uh, of the project, whether in terms of uh, and this is a good one. Uh, many times when you watch these Heishi TV programs, they say, well, I bought it for X, I sold it for Y. Sorry, I bought it for X, I the rehab cost Y, and the outcome was Z, Z, uh, say in England anyway. And uh, therefore, the profit is, you know, that, okay? So it's X, what you purchase for, plus your cost of rehab, and then you subtract that from the selling price, and that's, quote, unquote, your profit. That's what they say on TV, but I know, we know, you know, it's not as simple as that. There's a lot of hidden costs. There's a cost of financing. There's a cost of holding the thing. There are overruns in the rehabs. There's a cost of sale. You may have to put some concessions to the seller, or sorry, to the buyer. Uh, there are hidden costs which eats into your profit. So what you actually end up with is quite small, okay? So as a result of that, people get overextended. They get, uh, in order to get the project uh, to the finish line, you know, the, the rehab may be, uh, they run into problems whereby, you know, many times you do a rehab, you, don't really, you really don't know what's behind the walls. You really don't know uh, how much it's really gonna cost until you actually start. And so you make an estimate and uh, and sometimes those estimates are totally inaccurate, and therefore uh, you know you run into a, a situation whereby you're running short of money, or you have what we call scope issues, whereby you have change orders. When you start the project, you, you say I'm going to do A, B, C, but when you actually start and get into it, say well, wouldn't it be nice if we did A, B, C, D, E? Uh, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we did this? Wouldn't it be nice if we did that? And they all usually cost more money. And uh, if you don't have the money uh, set aside, you could quickly run out of money before you actually finish the project. And, uh, and therefore, it leaves you in a very, very precarious situation whereby you got a project which is not finished yet, but you ran out of money. And now you got to scurry around trying to find uh, money. And if you're not careful, you could, uh, you know, the project could come to a standstill because the contractor. Uh, would like to get paid and in order to continue, and you don't have the money to continue, so the project becomes a hold, a standstill. And so the contractor goes off somewhere else uh, until you get some money, and then they'll come back. And many times, if they go elsewhere, uh, it may take some time before they come back, which it breeds uh, you know, other problems. Uh, it's going to take you longer to finish, which means that your, um, your holding cost is going to be larger and so on. So you know, there's a lot of unforeseen uh, repairs, uh, especially nowadays where the cost of materials is going up and up. I don't know if you've been to Home Depot and Lowe's these days to check out the prices of some of these materials. Oh, my goodness. It's crazy. Um, and also the cost of rehabs. Uh, many times it takes longer than what you envision. If it takes longer, again, your holding cost is going to be larger larger. When I mean by holding costs, it means that things like <clears throat> you still got a mortgage to pay, you still got debt to pay, and you still got taxes, insurance, and uh, other things that you have to pay while you still own the asset. These are holding costs. And the longer the project takes, the more your cost is going to be. And it can quickly blow your budget, believe me. So, uh, so the key is to be successful in this is that you have to do your due diligence uh financially make sure you uh, kind of model how much you're going to need uh you budget correctly you have a right scope of work and you factor in other cost areas like the cost of purchasing the cost of renovation the cost of holding and have a contingency that's a good one have a contingency set aside 
for unknowns, variables, and uh, miscellaneous, and things like that. I mean, typically, you want to go 10, 15, 20% set aside for these unknowns. But it's important to have a, con uh, a contingency fund um, the, um, you know, built into the project such that when you run into issues or scope changes or whatever it is, at least you've got some money set aside to cover that. Okay, so what are some of the action items associated with uh, financial overextension? Okay, number one, make sure you perform a detailed uh, financial analysis before before you purchase the property, not after you purchase property. Before, do make sure you know the numbers, and uh, you know have a side. Another action item is to make sure you have set aside uh, a contingency fund, and uh, depending on the scope of the project, it could be 10, 20, 15 percent. Uh, in addition to the cost of the rehab. And then regularly review your financials as you're going through the project uh, to make sure that uh, you don't run out of money and make sure that if you are running out of money, you have plans in place such that you can get some money to finish the project off. So that's the first lesson learned from a failed, uh, failure, you know, to, uh, you know, pitfalls anyway. The second one, uh, I want to talk about is underestimating the renovation challenges, underestimating renovation, renovation challenge. This is another pitfall that, uh, you know, especially new investors uh, come face to faces. And what do I mean by that? Uh, underestimating the cost of the renovation. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that go on in a rehab. I mean, I recall uh, one of my rehabs where, you know, I didn't think I was going to replace the electrical system, but once we actually started, we realized it was pretty much shot. And so we had to set aside monies for that. Or you realize you don't know that the plumbing system, especially the plumbing system under the ground, like in the basement, and you know, you don't know how good or bad it is. And uh, there are times whereby, you know, after you've done the demo, now you can see the house for what it is. And then you realize, oh, my gosh, we have to replace this. We have to replace that. And uh, which wasn't, you know, factored in when you uh, did the initial scope of work or when you did your uh, initial, uh, you know, estimates and so on. So, uh, you know, there are times where I bought a house where there are some structural issues that we didn't know about. We only found it out when we did the demo and cleared the place out. We could see cracks in the wall. We could see water coming through in the basement. Uh, we could see the, the joist uh, wasn't strong uh, and therefore the floors weren't level and things like that. You don't know. And, uh, you know, and, and they could uh, be a ch very a challenge uh, once you start, especially uh, in the D.C. area. I'm sure many cities where you are, where you're dealing with older houses. Here it's very common to find hundred. 110, 120 year old houses, and uh, and so obviously, if you're dealing with older homes, there's a pretty good chance that you're going to have some issues uh, that you're going to have to bring up to date, whether it be plumbing, electrical, you know, heating or foundational or whatever it is, roof or or whatever. There's there's some you know issues that you're likely to face on these older homes. Uh, in some places, you've got things like even historic. If you bought a house in a historic district, then there's some compliance, there's some requirements uh, in terms of what you can and can't do, especially if it's exterior facing like the doors and the windows and, uh, and so on. So there are unforeseen issues that can really drastically increase the, the time it takes to complete a project, but also the cost associated with that. So a thorough property inspection, I think, is definitely uh, a good idea before you purchase a house, especially if you're new and uh and have a realistic scope of work and uh if possible work with experienced contractors uh res experienced uh you know uh mentors who can guide you as to uh you know what the cost is going to be how long the rehab is going to take and uh and things like that okay so that's what i mean by underestimating the the challenges associated with the rehab so what are some of the action items that uh, you can take uh, to uh, mitigate some of these things? One, uh, before you buy a house, obviously do a proper, a proper, a thorough, I suppose, property inspection before you purchase. 
then when you actually do the scope of work, uh, try to detail it. And, um, you know, in terms of uh, what needs to be done um, per room, uh, per level and things like that. And uh, estimate how much it's going to cost and also the time. And, uh, and prepare for unexpected issues. They will happen. Uh, it's just the way it is. And uh, also be, um, be cognizant of some of the, um, you know, the building regulations and, uh, and things like that, which I'll talk to a bit later on. So that's number two. Number three, uh, lessons uh, learned and, you know, things to avoid uh, um, is what I call market misjudgment. Uh, what I mean by that is misjudging the market, um, because if you if you miss the, if you do this wrong, uh, you could have a, you could be in big problems. What I mean by that is, for example, uh, you could be buying a house uh, during the heyday. Everything's going good, houses are moving fast. There's lots of buyers out there, and then you get all excited. You buy, you pay a little bit more for this house, and then you get you start going, and then the market shifts. There may be a slowdown in the market. Uh, it could change from a, uh, a seller's market to a buyer's market, you know, while you're doing the rehab. And I've seen this many, many times. And so they misjudge the market. And essentially what they are now, they're the, what's to say? Uh, they are, you know, they're standing up when the music stops and you don't want to be in that situation. Um, you know, you've paid with the assumption that price is going to go up and the prices do not go up. And therefore now you are stuck. And you have to reduce the price in order to move this thing. Uh, but you paid a lot of money for it, which means that, uh, you know, you don't have a whole lot of wiggle room in order to uh, keep your profits. So, uh, yeah, uh, I, I've seen that many, many, many times. I've been through five cycles and I've seen that's what drives people out of business is that the market turns on them. They can't offload these houses uh, or these properties. And now they have to reduce the price. And reduce the price which cuts into their uh profits and essentially they will then turn a profitable project into a loss making project and uh, so that's what we mean by market misjudgment i mean you don't know what the market is going to be no one knows what it's going to be tomorrow but you have to factor that in and uh and make sure that you are conservative especially if the market is uh like <clears throat> likely to shift so how do you address some of these things <clears throat> there's things like um comparables Make sure you do comps before you purchase a home. Uh, get true comps to be conservative. Uh, look at the neighborhood where you're buying. Is this the kind of place where people are desiring to live there? Uh, is there a, a demand uh, for a house and accommodation in your area? And what are some of the economic indicators that's taking place? Uh, interest rates in terms of uh, you know, interest rates, inflation, cost of living. All these things are economic factors, either macro level but also on a micro level, local or neighborhood level. Uh, these things are really important if you want to be able to survive as a flipper because flipping is purely a short-term strategy, which means that if the market changes on you in the short term, you could be having some serious problems. Now, if you do a long-term play, like a buy and hold, you know the market will change eventually, uh, hopefully turn around. And, and so you're not so much hostage to short-term factors. Uh, you just hold on to this thing as long as you got good tenants, as long as the, the asset is cash flowing. You know, you have some uh, flexibility or at least some um, uh, ability to hold on to this thing until, uh, you know, until the market shifts or goes up again. So what are some of the action items associated with uh, uh, market misjudgment? One is make sure you do your market research before purchasing the property. Um, you know, stay current with local trends. And develop a, a flexible strategy. You have to be able to be nimble uh, and be able to have multiple exit strategies uh, in the event that plan A doesn't work. You got a plan B. I always, when I, whenever I buy a house, I make sure that I have two exit strategies: a plan A, which could be the buy and hold, and plan B, I can sell this thing if I have to. So at least I have two options. Most people do not. They just go with one exit strategy, either to flip. And then the market shifts on them and they can't sell it. And now they can't rent it because the cash flow is not there and, or the rent that they need in order to support the debt is just not there. And therefore they have problems because they only have one exit strategy and that exit strategy is not conducive to the way the market is at that time. 
uh yeah so that's uh what's it called uh so be flexible be nimble uh just in case that the market turns on you um okay so anyway we're gonna have some if you got some questions please put them in the chat box i will get to them in about five or ten minutes from now uh anything to real estate anything to do with uh uh you know buy and hold anything to do with this topic i'm talking about flipping no matter no matter what it is put it the question in the chat box and i'll do what i can to try to uh, uh answer them for you in a few minutes number four overlooking the property's true potential that's another mistake uh pitfall many many uh you know uh investors or flippers um you know they overestimate the market appeal of the property uh, you know, sometimes you just look at the, the house and, uh, and overlook the neighborhood. Okay. And I, you know, especially if the neighborhood's declining, you think, oh, I've got a great deal. And therefore I buy the house because I got a good deal. When in fact, yeah, you may have got a good deal, but there are other factors. Maybe that's the reason why you got a good deal. Uh, for example, I bought a, I recall buying houses where, uh, I wasn't too much concerned about the neighbors or the neighborhood. I just got a good deal. I bought the house, uh, re renovated the house. In this case, I was trying to rent them. Uh, and I realized that the neighbors are not that great. You know, you got all kind of, you know, traffic going on nearby. And, uh, and I didn't factor that in. So I'm trying to rent this house. And I've got the, you know, the neighborhood gangsters, you know, uh, hanging out uh, next to my house. And so obviously, if I'm trying to sell, rent my house, it's hard. Uh, because people will come, they see the, you know, the gangsters and they keep going. So I've got a beautiful house, but people aren't coming inside because, uh, they, you know, they have perceptions about what's taking place next door or whatever it is. So, you know, you got to be careful about, uh, you know, make sure you understand the, uh, the dynamics of where your property is and, uh, and so on. So this is like, uh, how do you uh, address this? uh assessment you have a comprehensive assessment of the property before you purchase uh look around uh, the surrounding properties nearby to your where your property is and look at the overall overall uh growth uh trajectory i suppose uh for your house for your neighborhood and uh, and so on so it's really it's all about uh buying properties within uh you know inherent value uh that hopefully if you make the right improvements you're likely to attract buyers quickly so some of the action items associated with uh, uh, uh overlooking the property's true potential things like uh uh what's I say? assess the location a potential growth where you are uh focus on the intrinsic appeal of the property and uh, also consider some factors like functional layout and structural integ integrity of the property and so on. Uh, I'm going to kind of wrap it up now with number five. Well, I'll do a six as well. Maybe I'll throw one in. Uh, number five is inadequate skills. This is another pitfall uh, that investors have. They uh, take on a project, especially if they knew it, it looks easy and they start doing it themselves or they have the wrong people in, as part of their team uh, who don't have the necessary skills or expertise to actually do these projects. And uh, and that can be a disaster uh, because they can cause more problems than it's worth. Or you realize once you start the project, you are way over your head, and uh, and you, you know you're uh, uh, you know meeting complex problems that you don't know how to deal with. Um, so it's really important to have the right team. It's always really important to have the right skill sets as part of your operations, and uh, if possible, deal with experienced people. Uh, you, you don't want to be, you know, the guinea pig for these contractors. You want to have experienced people who've been there before. They know what they're doing. Uh, they can get permits and, uh, you know, they can just take the job to the finish line. Uh, it's really, really important. So how do you get this through mentors, coaches? Um, you know, obviously you can network with like-minded people. You can attend RIA meetings. And uh, also you can start off, your first project, especially on smaller projects. And uh, once that's done, it's successful, then you can move on to another bigger one and so forth. So you start small, you walk before you run and so on. So what are some of the action items associated with this? Assess your skill level uh, realistically and uh, seek education when necessary. 
uh, start small uh, on smaller manageable projects to gain the experience before you take on bigger ones and build a team of experienced professionals uh, that, uh, that are skills, skilled in various aspects of the, uh, you know, the flipping process. And then finally, number six, uh, you know, um, pitfall is ignoring the legal and regulatory requirements. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, legal and regulatory. Many times if you're doing a rehab, it requires building permits. Uh, you got to make sure you're compliant with zoning and uh and so on so uh if you don't have the right pro pro if you don't have the proper permits um you know you exposed um you know the city or the county or the state could shut your project down they could fine you uh there could be significant delays on the project especially if you had a, what we call a stop work um you know and so it's really important that you understand uh what the zoning requirements are what the building codes are and what the permit requirements are. You gotta understand the process. How do you get the building permits? What's the process? What do you need from the uh, the city, the county, the state in order for them to issue building permits? How many, how many permits do you need for your project? Do you need a building electrical plumbing, HVAC, or do you just need you know, one or two or whatever it is? So it's really understanding that, uh, you know, it, how the process is uh, done to get your permits is different. It's based on, you know, different localities have different processes. So you need to understand that. And you need to understand if you don't do it right, what's the likelihood of getting fined and uh, and so on. So before you start a project, really do the research uh, on the local regulations thoroughly to ensure that your project is compliant with the local laws and, uh, and make sure you have the necessary permits and uh, you regularly consult with experts, legal experts, to make sure that, uh, you know, legally you're, you're on good firm. Uh, and some of the action items associated with that, uh, ignoring, you know, uh, what's it called? Thoroughly research all your local zoning regulatory uh, building uh, rules before you start your project. Obtain all the necessary projects, uh, permits, sorry, and, uh, and consult with legal experts if you have to, to make sure you're on the right path legally. And then finally, conclusion, navigating the property flipping process, as you, as you can tell, is, is not easy. It's not as simple as just getting, get out, get paid, as these gurus tell you. There is, it's fraught with challenges. Uh, so it does require careful planning, market understanding, and adhering to local uh, legal standards. You know, this live stream hopefully uh, highlighted some of the common pitfalls uh, of doing flipping. Uh, if you're going to do it, do it properly, do it wisely. Make sure you surround yourself with the knowledge, the team, the processes, the systems. And uh, make sure that uh, you do, you know, thorough research, uh, realistic budgets, uh, market savvy, and you're in compliant legally. Uh, the important thing is that uh, you do require financial acumen. It does require some financial uh, management, uh, market understanding, uh, renovation expertise, and also legal knowledge. So uh, hopefully this is helpful. Uh, this session today. Again, flipping is a great strategy. It can get you chunks of cash, but uh, you better make sure you know what you're doing uh, because if you don't, it's uh, you could lose money and uh, not always, uh, you know, make money. And uh, you do a lot of work. And if you don't make any money, it's essentially you just wasted all your time. So just be careful. Uh, I primarily do buy and hold, but I've done flips. Uh, my experience with flips is that they're great, but you know, I rather just buy. And, I just rather just hold on to this thing, keep the asset, uh, get a great tenant, and let time take care of the appreciation, the tax benefits, and so forth. So hopefully that was a good session today, and let's go to uh, Q and A shortly. So again, put your questions in the chat box, and I'll get to them in a couple of minutes. If you need to reach out to me, uh, you can reach out to me at joe at joeasamoa.com. And last week, I, I told you, I gave people an opportunity if they want to, if they want to book a one-on-one -on -one with me where I can spend more time going to, you know, deep dive into a problem that you may have, a real estate-related problem. Uh, I'm now set it up whereby you can, um, you know, shoot me an email. I'll send you a Calendly link and we can do a one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, where we can really, really, I can understand your situation. 
and hopefully provide you with uh, some recommendations, solutions, some uh, uh, you know tactics uh, to resolve the problem that you may have. Uh, so if you if you feel that's going to be of if, of interest to you, uh, shoot me an email. Uh, you can shoot me an email at joe at joeasimo.com, joe at joeasimo.com, and uh, I'll schedule you uh, calendar. It is it is paid though. Uh, again, full disclosure, it's not free. Uh, it's be one on one hour of one on one with you and I. Uh, my goal is to provide you with, you know, it costs one hundred and seventy five dollars for one hour, which is very reasonable. You could book thirty minutes for one dollar, a hundred dollars, sorry, uh, or or an hour for 175 my goal is that if you book an hour then i'm going to give you you know 2x in terms of value that's my goal uh, everyone that's been doing these one-on-one has really been thoroughly happy with the results so anyway, if you're interested uh shoot me an email joe at joeasimo.com and i'll send you a calendar link where you can schedule and we can do a one-on-one to deep dive um uh, you know and so on so you can book a one-on-one with me so let's get down to the comments and let's see if I can get to them. Let's have a look. Greetings, Dautu from Phoenix. I'm sure it's hot where you are. It's definitely a lot cold over here. Michelle. Oh, Michelle. Hey, how you doing, Michelle? So I don't know if you're in town or not, but, uh, you know, uh, I'm here. So hopefully we can connect at some point. So I hope all is well with you. Uh, Michelle is in England, but she spends some time here in the U.S. every now and then and so on. Uh, Motor City Car Cult. Dr. Joe is the GOAT. Okay, the greatest of all time, huh? Okay. Uh, okay, so Michelle is still in London. She'll be back on 2nd of February. Wow, it's now 7 o'clock over here, 7.30, so it must be 12.30 in London. Uh, I spoke to my sister today. She's in London. It's pretty cold over there, uh, but not as cold as here. Uh, Hector, how are you doing? From Northern Virginia here, it's always great information received when I tune into this call. Thank you, Hector. I appreciate you uh, uh, being a part of today's session. Again, if you've got some questions you want to throw at me, feel free to put them in the chat box and I'll try to answer them. Dr. Joe from New York City, Kareem. Hey, Kareem, hope you're doing well. And we have Get Lobster. Hey, how you doing, man? Get Lobster, hope all is well where you are. And let's have a look. Hector, best way to track expenses and the realistic time it may take and the control of the timing, what it will be a good tool to use okay so let me make sure i understand this question hector's asking what are the best ways to track expenses and uh, what's the realistic time it takes to do a rehab and how do you control that and what are some of the tools uh that uh he can use or i i, I what i use uh when i manage my rehabs is a tool called flippers cash flow analyzer C flippers cash flow analyzer uh it's a pretty nice tool uh, it's, an, it's kind of like an Excel based program. Uh, I know there's lots of other ones out here, but that's what I use. It's 99 bucks. It's really good. And it allows me to track my projects. It allows, it allows me to do generate reports, uh, especially reports, uh, associated with, uh, raising money, uh, you know, getting private money. And it's a pretty nice tool. Again, it's flippers, cash flow analyzer. I don't make any money from that recommendation. I'm just showing you what I use. Uh, in terms of the length of time, it takes uh, your key to your success, uh, Hector, on, if you're going to do these flips, is getting good contractors. If you can get good contractors, that is most of your problems solved there. It's hard to find good contractors. There's a lot of contractors out there. There's not a lot of good ones. Uh, what I mean by good ones, people that will can do the job, no drama, uh, not a whole lot of back and forth arguments. Uh, stress and strife it's just it's a pain when you got difficult ten, uh contractors uh, i'm sure people who've done rehabs will understand where i'm coming from um you know i mean i can share with you some horror stories but I, i'll leave that alone so i use my contractors i use them now for about 10 years i think they're probably more than that now they're the other ones i use i don't use anybody else uh it's just it's great when you get good contractors uh because uh you know they get the job done without a whole lot of stress and uh and peace of mind is definitely worth something uh and what i also tell you is that the cheapest guy is not always the best guy you know sometimes these contractors purposely underbid so they can get their foot in the door 
and they realize they're not making any money. And so they start sort of hitting you up with uh, change orders and extras and, uh, and things like that. So that can be very, very frustrating and, uh, and so on. So picking the right contract, I think, is going to be the key uh, in order to make sure that you complete these projects and still have your sanity. Uh, because otherwise you can drive you crazy uh, and so on. So hopefully I've answered the question, Hector, and uh, feel free to, uh, you know, if I haven't, uh, you know, put a follow-up question as well. Karim, I'm looking at Philly PA market as a remote rental. However, it changes by block in terms of the neighborhood. What other things should I consider when looking at the property? Uh, I'm not familiar with Philly, Philadelphia. I don't own anything over there, but generally, um uh, you know it sounds like yours more than it's it's block based i know the folks down in baltimore uh cause again i don't buy down there as well but they say it's very block based uh in dc it's not so much block by block it's more of a neighborhood um uh, you know so you can go from one neighborhood to another neighborhood the prices change as opposed to go from one block to another block so again it just depends on the locality they're in uh what other things should you consider I always look at the um, the you know the surrounding the immediately surrounding area around your property. Uh, you know, are people moving in? Are people moving out? Is it easy to uh, find uh, good tenants? Is it easy to uh, to sell homes? Uh, what's what's happened historically? Have prices gone up? Um, you know, what's going on locally? Are, are, are businesses moving in? Uh, it, what's the public transportation? What's the education systems like? Uh, what's the recreation facilities around the area? So there's some macro level things that you need to look at, uh, Karim. But there's also some micro level uh, things that you need to consider as well. Uh, not just the property, uh, which obviously has got its own, own set of things like, you know, what's the rehab? What's the condition? How much work needs to be done? What's the price? Uh, are you overpaying? What's the median? And all that kind of stuff. Uh, but you also got some um, you know, micro level, neighborhood level considerations that you have to factor in as well. So again, I hope that was helpful. Uh, get Lobster. What to say over a phone call to a landlord who we learned may be interested in selling his rental property off market. This is our first attempt at REI and we've not had any luck in our area so far okay so get lobster is saying that uh he's identified an off-market deal with a landlord who's trying to sell the property so what does he need to say to the landlord obviously you want to find out why he's um you know why is he selling sometimes he's trying to sell because he's trying to get rid of pass off his problems to you uh so it's good you know to find out why he's selling he may not or she may not tell you the truth it's always good to find out, um, you know, if it's, uh, an, you know, if it's a rental property, you may want to, um, you know, does your city state area require that uh, you're going to inherit these tenants? If you're going to inherit these tenants, you want to know more about the tenant, how much they pay. You want to look at their leases, uh, the security deposits. There's some due diligence that you're going to have to do. Uh, I would definitely suggest that you visit the property and try to speak to the tenant if possible um again you know inheriting bad tenants is not it's not good it's you know you can turn it around but it's just you know it's it's just a lot of hassle so i'll do some due diligence there and uh you know obviously you're going to negotiate the price hopefully you can get a a decent discount and uh, depending on the condition of the property it may make sense to uh do some repairs before you re-rent or sell and um you know, and so on. So if you've got some tenants in there, you want to know, obviously, how long they've been there. Are they likely to stay? And, uh, and and speak to them if you can. Look at their leases and make sure that you get that security deposit that the owner has kept. So hopefully you'll be lucky. I get a lot of You didn't say, you know, which part of town it's in. But I'm assuming it's in a desirable part of town that you're interested in, in investing in. Uh, hopefully that was helpful. So again, if you got some additional questions, feel free to add on there. Are there other fixed expenses people forget to build into their deal analysis, e.g., lawn, lawn care, property management software? We should know about. We should know about. Okay, yeah, the other 
there are fixed expenses and there are variable expenses. Okay, fixed expenses are things like obviously you've got um, the mortgage, you got uh, utility. Well, no, that's a variable expense. I mean, you got some expenses that are you know continuous and that you have to factor in. And uh, then you have the other expense, which are more variable. It just depends on the month or the you know the season or whatever it is. Uh, like you said, lawn care, property management, and so on. So uh, there are things that you need to factor in and put all the expenses together. Hopefully, you can get the the roster or the what's it called? The operating agreement? No, it's not the operating agreement. Um, it's the operating document from the current owner. Uh, so hopefully, he'll be able to tell you. Um, you know, the financials, the PL. Uh, so that way the, the current owner can share with you the PL. Now they may or may not give you the right information, but it may be worthwhile to look at their tax returns. Um, uh, because very few people overestimate the uh income and very few people underestimate their expenses on the tax returns. So you want to look at the tax returns and see how uh what you know whether the tax return says what they uh what they uh, you know what they're sharing with you okay uh and so on okay uh marlon hey marlon hope all is well where you are and let's have a look we got monet uh from norton massachusetts hope you're doing well uh monet and uh Let's have a look. Do I need to remove lead paint in order to rent a house with lead paint? No, you don't need to remove uh, the lead paint, but uh, the, the lead paint doesn't have to, it cannot be peeling, uh, peeling paint or, you know, um, expose, you know, uh, deteriorating paint and things like that. You can't, you, you're going to have to correct that problem before you uh, rent your house. You don't need, at least not around here, you don't need to have a lead-free house. You need to have a lead-safe house. Okay, there's a difference. Lead-free means that you take all the paint out of the house, uh, especially if it's an older home built before 1978. Uh, most houses built, you know, especially in the, 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 you know, where we are in the DC area, were built before, way before 1978. So there's probably some lead in there. Uh, we're not required to remove the lead, but we are required to make sure it's a lead safe house. And then you have to have the place inspected, um, you know, lead, what we call lead clearance uh, before you can rent the house out. So typically an inspector will come to the house. They'll do some dust wipes or they may use what we call an XRF machine uh, to test the house for lead. And then they'll give you a report. You have to share that report uh, with the tenant. And if there are some areas which are not safe, then you are required to correct it before you rent it to the next tenant. So again, to answer your question, you don't have to remove the paint. Uh, it doesn't have to be lead free, but it has to be lead safe. And there are some federal disclosures. And there may be some local disclosures or state lo level disclosures that you have to give to the tenant and so on. So if that was helpful. Uh, Karim, I'm identifying the rent amount. So what's the time? 7.45. I'm identifying the rent amount I'm looking for and searching in affordable housing site, then identifying those specific area. How accurate is that method given the market is remote? Okay, so Karim is buying a house, I think he said Philadelphia, and he's trying to gauge how much does he get, uh, how, much, how much rent is he going to get. Uh, assuming that you're going to rent to Section 8, then you're going to be dealing with uh, the local housing authority. I'm not too sure what it is in Philadelphia. Let's just for argument's sake call it the Philadelphia Housing Authority. I could be wrong, but let's just assume that. So what I would do if you're not local is to contact the uh, the Philadelphia Housing Authority and find out from them how do they determine their rents? You know, um, is it zip code based? Is it neighborhood based? Uh, is, you know, whatever it is. And uh, is it published? If it is, then you need to get a copy of that. How is it determined? Who determines if it's if you're going to get X versus Y rent and things like that? So I would find out from them, and I would contact them, as opposed to just doing your uh, a Google search. Because sometimes, like in Washington D.C., uh, what's published and what's actually you get is two different things. And so the housing authorities usually will be able to tell you what sources of information they use 
in order to determine their rent. So that's what I would do. It'll save you a lot of time, a lot of guesswork. Just go straight to the source and the source will tell you how they determine rent. And now, so essentially now uh, you've taken the, the guessing game out and then you can now determine what the rents are uh, based on the zip code, the neighborhood or whatever it is that they use to determine the rents. So uh, yeah, hopefully that was helpful. And uh, it's always changing. I know in DC, they changed that around in July of last year. Uh, they used to have it neighborhood based, but it's, sorry, uh, yeah, neighborhood based. They've now changed it to a comparable based. GN, how do you find the rate for Section 8 and the demand in the area? Okay, good question. How do you find the rate? As I said before, you, there, lots of times the housing authority will publish the, the rents in the local area where you are. Uh, there should be some websites. Uh, where this information uh, resides. If not, then I would call the housing authority and uh, they will then uh, you know, direct you to you know, the site or information that they use to determine rent. So that's how I would do that. Now, in terms of demand, uh, what I would do is, again, contact the housing authority. They will tell you uh, if, you know, who, you know, if, they, if they need uh, one bedroom, two bedrooms, three bedrooms, four bedrooms, five bedrooms, six bedrooms. Do they need it? Are there enough um, tenants or clients with vouchers in two, three, four, five, six bedrooms uh, out there? So that'll give you an idea of the, the demand. And, uh, and that's what I did when I contacted DC many years ago. They told me, uh, one, two, three, uh, we can always find people, uh, landlords, uh, that have one, two, three bedroom houses and apartments, but four, five, and sixes were just a lot more difficult. Uh, and so I decided to go for four, five, sixes because the demand was there, but the supply was not. Uh, and I didn't want to compete in an area whereby there's uh, high demand, high supply. I prefer to have high demand, low supply. Hopefully that helps. Oh, wow. We've got a lot of good questions today. Uh, Aaron Foster, DC local here. Hi, Aaron. Thanks for getting back to me. The voucher system changed in mid 2023. Yes, July. They were paying 187 uh, above fair market rent in DC. Yes, uh, but now it's up to the inspector. Not really. How do you calculate the, your purchase now without the knowing the actual voucher standard? Also, I seen your products around town. Appreciate the hard work and good product. Thank you, uh, Aaron. Okay, so you've been. I don't know, stalking me, huh? Okay, so uh, yeah, they did change the 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 the, the DC in uh, July the first, twenty twenty three. It's not the the actual rent is not determined by the inspector. They have a website now. Again, shoot shoot me an email. I'll be more than happy to share information about that, where you can plug in your address of your property, and you can plug in the number of bedrooms, and it'll tell you approximately how much you can get uh, for rent. Uh, there are two sides. There's outside the firewall, which is what we see. And there's also inside the firewall, which is what the housing uh, authority uses. Now, as part of that process, you have to indicate the amenities uh, on your property. Do you have uh, ceiling fans? Do you have a washer dryer? Do you have off street parking? Do you have all these different amenities? And based on appliances. So based on the amenities that you have, uh, you may be able to get a little bit more rent. Now, the inspector when they show up to do their what we call HQS housing quality standards inspection, they will confirm that what you said is what you have. So if you said I have this, this, and this, and you don't have it, then the inspector will be the one that will confirm that you don't have it. And if you don't have it and you said you did, then you may not get the rent that you want. So the inspector doesn't determine the rent per se, not in Washington, DC. Now in other parts, of the country. I know in Prince George's County or some of the neighboring areas where I was, uh, the inspector had a, a big role uh, in the final rent. But in Washington, the inspector is more of a confirmation. Uh, they have other, the caseworker is the one that actually determines the rent, um, you know, and so on. So uh, hopefully that was helpful. And, uh, but yeah, great to, you know, talk with you uh, and communicate with you, Aaron. So let me know if I can be a further assistance to you. Manette, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, get live. So in terms of discussing with an off-market seller, 
is it best to have our realtor take charge of the process or we first attempt the discussion on our own? It depends on what your comfort level is. Uh, if you feel comfortable reaching out to the owner, then you may be able to do a one on off market you know, deal without getting the, you don't need a realtor in, in, involved you, you know, in terms of negotiate for you. If you feel comfortable, you can approach the owner and uh, you know, start the ball rolling in terms of uh, finding out what his situation is, uh, what's driving the sale, and uh, what's his motivation level, and uh, find out how much they're looking to sell it for. Obviously, you've done your comparables to find out if that's a fair price, and then you can make an offer, and then you're probably going to do some negotiations, and ultimately, hopefully, you'll get some kind of meeting in the minds and uh and therefore you can put in a contract and then move forward so you don't need a uh, a realtor per se uh but if you don't feel comfortable then i will definitely suggest that you get somebody uh to represent your interests uh during the negotiations and due diligence period as well okay let's have a look katie katie bbl hey katie hope you're doing well uh permitting legalities etc have you ever experienced a surprising inspection compliance hiccup with a newly rented property what was the process like with the housing authority reinspection etc okay i think i understand the question uh katie uh have you had uh okay so there are different inspections in the process um uh, if you are talking about the section a process then there are typically two inspections done uh, there's an inspection before the tenant moves in. And then once the tenant is moved in, there's usually an annual or biannual inspections uh, that's conducted. So that's when the inspectors come in, either before the tenant moves in or once they're in, on a, on a, you know, once a year or once every two years. Uh, I have a pretty, you know, what you want to do is contact the housing authority and find out from them what do these inspectors look for uh, when they show up at your house, okay? You want to know. And so if they're looking for A, B, C, D, then you want to make sure that uh, you've checked A, B, C, D, E beforehand. And uh, if there's any problems with A, B, C, D, E, then you fix it before the inspector shows up, okay? So that's what I would do, first of all, is to find out what do they inspect for? And that's usually published. Uh, you can you know, it's 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 available out there. What you know, they, they look for mainly health and safety uh, related things. But you want to find out specifically what they look for. I always think it's a good idea to check uh, the property before the inspector comes. I want to pass first time round, so uh, so I try to uh, do that. And uh, if you if the if you fail the inspection, typically you get. Uh, a grace period in order to correct the problem. If it's a moving inspection, it's a shorter period of time because there's no one there. If it's an annual inspection or biannual inspection, typically you have 28 to 30 days uh, you know, before the inspector comes back and then they will re-inspect and make sure that the items which they flagged, uh, you have taken care of them. So, uh, so that's, you know, I've had some uh, hiccups. Yeah, as you call it. Yeah, oh yeah, oh definitely. Uh, I've had some really strange ones where I just can flat out disagree with what the inspector is saying. Or sometimes the, the tenant causes damage and they expect the landlord to fix it uh, and so on. So there are some, definitely some uh, things to be aware of. Uh, you know, if you're going to have a, either a moving inspection or, or an annual inspection that you want to get comfortable with the process uh, beforehand. And I try to get my tenants to be cooperative as well. And, uh, and therefore, the inspections, my goal, as I said before, is to pass first time round. And, uh, and I'm having some pretty good success working closely with my tenants like a partnership. Uh, such that it's in their interest to that I pass the inspection or the house passes the inspection as well. A tricky thing that DC does, I don't know if they still do it, but they used to do it, uh, which is uh, as part of the inspection process, the inspector would ask the tenant, you know, uh, are there anything wrong with the house? Okay, so 
So this is a time, if you have an adversarial relationship with your tenant, this is a time for the tenant to get even with you. So, so be careful, uh, you know, and it could be payback time and so on. So again, it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward, the inspection process. Once you understand what they look for, then I think you can act accordingly. Uh, get lobster. Thank you. You're welcome. And Katie, again, specifically with a voucher Section 8 program. Yeah, as I said before, uh, with a Section 8 program, there are two lots of inspections. Um, the inspection that they do is what we call housing quality standards, HQS. These are federal standards that, uh, you know, HUD imposes. Uh, and so you can do some research to look through, uh, do a search on housing quality standards, HQS, and uh, they'll tell you, you know, typically what they look for as part of the inspection process. You can contact your local housing authority. They'll tell you, or you can do a Google search and uh, and find out yourself. So it's now about eight o'clock. I think we had a good session today. I uh, hope all is well. Again, if you would like to have one-on-one -on -one time with me, and again, you know, if you want to, that is, um, shoot me an email at joe at joeasimo.com. We can book an hour one-on-one, -on -one, where we can do a deep dive, more deeper than what we could do today uh, during the uh, Q&A session. But we can really spend some time. If you've got some pressing issues, tenant issues, landlord issues, rehab issues, property deals, or whatever it is, and you feel that can be of assistance to you, provide some insights and guidance, then please uh, shoot me an email, and I'll send you a link where you can book a one-on-one -on -one with me. Uh, it's not free. Again, full disclosure, it's $175 for one hour. Uh, but everybody that's done it has been thoroughly, completely satisfied. My goal is you spend a dollar with me. I'm trying to get you 2 or $3 back in terms of value and, uh, and so on. So it's a real good session. It's an opportunity for you and I to get to know each other and uh, try to put our heads together to solve a problem that you may be facing. And hopefully it'll allow you to keep going as well. So again, shoot me an email, joe at joeasimo.com, and request that uh, you book, and I'll send you a link for you to schedule uh, at your convenience. So with that said, some of my friends, it's now 8 o'clock. Uh, I will see you next Wednesday, and have a great day. Take care, guys. Bye for now.